Of course, uh, still some of the highlights uh, are coming from the, the President's uh, Independence Anniversary speech on Tuesday, October 1 in Nigeria. We're still very much in the mood. Uh, don't forget, um, we're looking at um, the economy, security, and all of the big issues that came out of the of the speech and some other issues that um, certain people thought should have been part of the speech that wasn't part of the speech. We've been joined now virtually by Sheyi Clement, who is a lawyer and political affairs analyst. Mr. Sheyi Clement, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me and happy Independence Day in arrears. <laughs> All right, uh, David. Yes, and then on the other side will be Roy Ohilivier, who is a, a security expert. He joins us also uh, virtually uh, this morning. Gentlemen, such a pleasure having the, this lineup of panelists on the show today. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. It's mm -hmm. always a pleasure. Always, always a pleasure. All right, I think it will be a good place to start with you, Roy. And um, we we'll always want to sample your, your thoughts around the, the president's speech. Uh, everybody we speak with on the show, we start off with um, sampling the president's speech or their thoughts on the president's speech. So, uh, Roy, security experts, let's, let's get your thoughts. The, the president did sound like um, they are doing very well in, uh, in fighting insecurity in Nigeria. Uh, I don't know what your perspective will be around that. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I always enjoy speaking with you and um, interacting with you on all of these discussions. Let us be sincere. The president's speech is written to capture an interface of an image for Nigeria. The president's speech is written to guide international investment to propagate harmony for all the disgruntlement in Nigeria. The president's speech is written to capture a good background from the political party that he comes from. The president's speech is written to showcase the efforts of his alignment with the promises he made during his um, political campaign and after assuming office. So I don't want to tackle the speech because it was properly prepared to harmonize all of these areas that I have mentioned so far. So I think we should look the implications of his speech and the workability of his speech. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And let me switch um, to um, Mr. Sheikh Clements now. Um, do you agree? Well, I don't disagree in any case. I mean, I, I mean the president should be uh, his own um, uh, PR person. You know, he should be able to speak positively about what he has done. You don't expect the president to come and say, I haven't done much. You know, he, I mean, we need to know. He will tell us naturally what he has done. Uh, but are you uh, in any way, uh, what, what are your thoughts about the, about the speech on Independence Day? Uh, it was a well, as my colleague said, it was a well-written speech and well-delivered. Um, and that's about the most I can say about it. In terms of the issues that concerns the country, um, in terms of the political development and the embedment of our political institutions, the speech was lacking in those. One of the issues that he has championed for a long time, whilst not in office, and also whilst he was campaigning, was the issue about um, constitutional reforms, which is lacking uh, in, in his speech. So those are the issues that concerns me very much in terms of how do we deepen democracy in the country? Because if we look at the trajectory of democratic development in the country, it's not looking good at all. Uh, year on year, or election circle upon election circle, those who are turning out to vote at elections are dwindling. We now have election, which was in 2023, where only 26% of registered voters bothered to go to the polls. We tells you that the vast majority of Nigerians are voting by the seat of their pants. They are sitting at home. They're not bothering to vote. If we put that figure into context, that is less than 4% of the population. 
voted for this current president, uh, Bola Menchinumbu, less than 4% of the population. That is a, a, a abysmal figure in terms of approval. From 2000 and, uh, 2011 to date, those of us going to polls have been dwindling by, by, by has been falling by four, about eight percent on average every election circle. We will probably get to a stage where only about two percent of us bother to go to the polls. Those are the issues for me in terms of political development and embedding the democratic institutions that we should be looking at, uh, and that is lacking in the speech. I'm, I'm sorry to say. So, 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 in other words, it was not a well put out speech. Initially, you did say it was well written and uh, well delivered. Uh, then, if if there are lacunas like the one you've just highlighted, uh, then there are there are indeed other concerns. Uh, many would also say that um, what is what is important to many Nigerians today is uh, the hardship that they are faced with, uh, the economic hardship that they are faced with, and. Um, uh, they are not excited that that was not well addressed. Uh, you know, primarily they just think that um, uh, the government has not given a roadmap uh, to where, where we are headed as a people in terms of um, these economic hardship that Nigerians are faced with. That is correct, but the economic hardship itself, it's, it's, it's a symptom of some other issues. It's going to be difficult for you to solve the economic hardship without save, uh, dealing with the fundamental issues. The first question we need to ask ourselves is that are we having our best team for For that is that the political system is such that it is difficult for us to have our best team forward. And when you don't have something like that, it's going to be difficult for you to be tackling economic issues without looking at social issues, without looking at the, at the defense, at the security issues. So this, the security of greater malaise within the system. So uh, even if he says something about it, I will not believe it because I know it's not going to happen. Is not the, the food inflation is not going to drop from 40% to 60% without you tackling the security issues. You are, without tackling the infrastructure issue, you cannot have the youth unemployment, which is about 50%, cannot suddenly drop to 25% unless you just the, uh, deal with the power issue. Without the power, you cannot have economic, you cannot have industrial development. Without security, you cannot have food security, uh, sorry, without, with insecurity that which we have, you cannot have food security. So we're looking at the symptoms without looking at the, the fundamental issues that cause the symptoms. That, that's why I, I feel that the, the speech itself is lacking in substance. Oh, well right. written, hmm. it's a PR exercise, as PR exercise goes, maybe it works. All right, so just before we go back to uh, Ambassador Roy, uh, you, you talked about the fact that uh, one of the things that was lacking in that speech is, you know, the concerns around constitutional reforms. Uh, so, so I'd like to ask you, in specific terms, which areas would you be uh, talking to, the, uh, to Nigerians about at this time, considering the fact that it's our 64th anniversary and we're trying to, you know, get our nation together again, you know, apart from the fact we're trying to connect with our history, we're asking questions about where are we and how do we get to where we intend to be. So what kinds of constitutional reforms did you not see in, in, in that speech? In, in terms of constitutional reforms, I think the first thing we should be asking ourselves is what do we want for our country? We've never had the introspection to ask the question, what do we want for our country? You look at the, the 1999 constitution as amended. This constitution came into being after the 1999 elections no consultation. So we now have a document which was produced by the military, of course, with, uh, with, uh, with, with drafters and lawyers involved, but produced by the military for a regime that they were not part of. We were never consulted on. And that's why year, election circle upon election circle, we have people sitting with the seat of their pen, voting with the seat of their pens, not going to polls. The first question we now ask ourselves is what do we want? from a democratic dispensation. Until we ask that question, we just be going around the circle. 
Some people will come and say, oh, the parliamentary system is better, our original government is better. But these are people coming, uh, talking from a standpoint of personal interest. In terms of what the man on the street wants, nobody's asking him what he wants. We have a parliamentary, we have a system whereby we have senators and members of House of Representatives that people don't know what they do. And because of that, people are saying, oh, why should it be full time? Because we still don't know what their job description is. In most cases, some of our House of Reps and our senators are more, more or less social service providers. They're doing things like paying children's school fees, things like paving roads, doing the like street lights. That is not the job of a parliamentarian. Those are the questions we need to ask ourselves first. What do we want from the system? And from then on, we can begin to build a superstructure on our common goals. All right. What do we want as, as a system? I, I'll get back to you on that, um, um, Shay Clement. Let, let's let's speak to Roy and get his perspective on uh, the three over 300 um, uh, Boko Haram terrorists that have been eliminated by this administration has um, put forward by Mr. President's speech uh, yesterday. And um, uh, you know what we should what we should be doing. Uh, uh, Roy, I, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, worried because you did say that the president's speech was um, was 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 made uh, to to paint a picture. Yes, yeah, to paint a picture uh, to to us and also to domestic, I mean, to international uh, 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 investors. I don't know what you think about this 300. Um, um, commanders of, of uh, Boko Haram that have been eliminated and um, how these will uh, further, you know, take us to where we want to get in the fight against insecurity in Nigeria. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. And um, I'm just, I was just enjoying the other guests also. Now, um, most of us that are proficient in counter-terrorism and um, global terrorism, um, manifestation and um, infestation. We we understand that killing a a a terrorist leader does not actually decamp the unit. You know, even if you look at Hezbollah, a leader as strong as the one that was killed was replaced almost immediately, and um, <laughs> Israel had to remove the other one too within hours of um of being enthroned you know but let me take you let me take you to a speech since we are talking about speeches a speech the president made during his time of campaign you know then many people were using it as comedy but i was kept i was careful to write it down you know he said he's going to employ thousands of police, military people, and all that. And what will they eat? He said, eh, wah, this and that, eh, go, I, I don't know how he put it in Yoruba. You know, it was funny. People use it as a slogan. People use it as comedy. But I was interested. I was happy. You know, because what do we eat right now? Those things he mentioned are the things we eat right now. You know, then subsequently, the recruitment en mass would have favored the police and the military in ejecting the appropriate classification of Nigerians that would show patriotism. You know, then I mentioned also that we have so many universities in Nigeria that are training Nigerians. They pass out after five years, if no strike, and come out as security intelligence, security practitioner, criminologists, and all that. And I was saying, most of these people are being employed in different organizations currently, and they are taking 50,000 naira, 60,000 naira. Why can't you focus those universities? Go and meet them. Let them give you the list of those that have graduated, that fall into the age bracket of the kind of people you need, and send them SMS, book SMS, emails, and invite them to the agencies, organizations, you want to employ them. The president was insisting on employment for these people. And even in this speech, he mentioned that Nigerians' uh, unemployment has dropped. 
Now, let me shock you. In the first instance, two, two major malaise happens. One, during recruitment, people come to the recruitment centers with a list from a notable Nigerian that has the power to influence or manipulate anything. The second problem you have is that people come without having appropriate qualifications. So they are not qualified for the job, but they must be taken, becoming a baggage, a negative component of the purpose of that recruitment. You know, so we have a problem with the curriculum of our agencies today. You know, the academic level of all our people that are in superior positions is, is, is disheartening because they cannot imply proper management of the personnel. You know, so most of these things are becoming a major challenge to those managing the affairs of the agencies. All right. Um, I, I like the way you have um, tried to comprehensively, you know, address, address uh, some of these concerns. Uh, but, but, but then again, I want us to still, you know, look at some specifics. Uh, people ask the question, you are a security expert, about whether indeed we have made progress in terms of uh, the effort that we're, that we're putting into security. Uh, the issue of a banditry, kidnapping, uh, and of course um, the Boko Haram uh, issue, terrorism that we have uh, uh, in this uh, northeast. Uh, again, don't forget that even as we speak in the southeast, there are still, you know, challenges with security, police stations being attacked, police checkpoints, police personnel being killed and all of that. Uh, questions about kidnapping is still, you know, there, you know. Uh, we, can we say we have actually made the kind of progress that, should be proud, that we should be proud of at 64? Thank you very much. Um, I'm not even going to say let me look at the progress at the age of 64. I would like to say, let me look at the progress at the level of academic, professional, and everywhere we are of Nigerians. Nigerians are making waves globally. You know, even Nigerians in the, in the United States here, even Nigerians in Russia, let me even take you far away to a, a snow-based island. You know, I have friends there that are relevant in decision-making for those countries, you know? So if you look at progress as we wanted to capture it, now progress will be termed as activating effectiveness for our agencies and parastatas. My colleague there, uh, the learned friend, he, he has mentioned part of it, you know, the workability of agencies like the the federal institutions now we want to look at boko haram as an example are we supposed to be getting happy getting comfortable because of the numbers we have killed no why because they still have an effective recruitment and radicalization process so if we kill 20 they can recruit 30 40 immediately and they can bring them from across the border now if you also look at their ability to escape justice you will ask yourself if you are making progress now so many times negotiations are made to get these people out of justice plan the criminal justice system has not been effectively imputed in the crime of participation in terrorism now we negotiate now let me shock you also so many times we have had prison break and most of the prisoners that were caught and brought back we tell you that it was an instituted plan you know it was a negotiation with government to let go some of their people now we have seen the rots in the prison system and we are looking at the minister of the interior and saying you have been shouting you have made progress where have your progress been you know so we make progress for things we can air on social media we can air to international communities to still win their favors 
but we are not making sustainable progress in the parastatals and institutions and the criminal justice system we put in place. Go to the prisons today. There are so many people that have been arrested awaiting trials. Go to the prison also. There are people that have been arrested for criminal activities. They are not in the prisons. They are somewhere else. They are enjoying the more liberty than even I and you that I said that said we are crime free. You know, so we have not made any progress by the number of Boko Haram personnel that we showcase that we have killed because we don't have an institutional system that will deter terrorism and will impute and execute quickly penalties for getting involved in criminal activities in Nigeria. Very well said, Roy. I must say, very, very well put together uh, if we must move forward in the fight against insecurity. Very well put together. Uh, let's, let's come to you, Shay, uh, and, and get your thoughts. Uh, one of the biggest uh, conversations that has come out of Mr. President's speech is uh, uh, proposed um, inclusivity for Nigerian youth, proposed um, conference uh, for Nigerian youth. So many have argued that um, it will be a an exercise in futility uh, given to the structural uh, deficiency that we have in, in the nation, uh, the lack of trust in the system, and um, the, the, the fact that the system is rigged towards um, a particular uh, a set, I mean, uh, particular individual, I was talking about the elites in Nigeria, and then political elites, one must say. Uh, so it, it has raised quite a number of concerns. Many have also said that, yes, there, there's probably a need for our government to continue dialoguing. But a, a, a youth conference at this point in time for 30 days, uh, where do you think this could take us to, Shay? It depends on, oh, thank you. For, that's a very, very Jamaica question, because if we look at the population of Nigeria, we're predominantly a youth population, which in many countries will look at it as a very, very positive, and in, in Nigeria as well. Because we can see what our youth are doing in the enter entertainment industry, uh, also in the IT industry, whether inside or outside Nigeria. So it is it is a welcome development. The question is, what do we intend to get out of it? Because if it's just a talk shop, it's just a waste of everybody's time. There, but there are issues that we need to address. Just picking on from what my colleague have said, we should be. Um, Alarmed by the fact that we have almost 2.6 million children out of school in the country, particularly in the north. Is the youth conference to deal with that? We have more than 7 million, uh, 4 million people displaced in the north because of insurgency and all that. Is the youth conference going to deal with that? The interaction between the, the security services and the youth, are we going to deal with that? This is not the first time we had the NSAS, we had N, uh, the end bad government being propagated by the by the youth. What did we get out of that? We had the youth being shot. Some of them still been in prison. It will shock you to know that some of those who are arrested during NSAS, some of them are still in detention. Almost four years after NSAS, no trial, but they're still in detention. So if we're going to have another conference, and we're very, very good at having conferences, which has not good, which is not going to produce anything, then it's just a waste of everybody's time. Um, and I cannot see. I'm not. I'm. I'm hoping that this will be a different. Uh, will, will be different from the other uh, conferences we've had. But I am not. Uh, I'm not optimistic about it, unfortunately, because there are other things they could have done to show good intention on this on on this issue. Uh, like I said, we have youth unemployment. There is nothing, no concrete plan to address youth unemployment. You have uh, out of school children. There's no concrete plan to do, address that. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not optimistic about it. But I'm hopeful. All right. All right. Yeah. You talked about um, incidentally. I was going to take you up on youth unemployment, and you just mentioned it uh, because I know that um, if you look at uh, the statistics. Um, quite a huge number of youths are unemployed or maybe underemployed. Uh, and then if you now see you're trying to set up a youth conference that will last for as much as 30 days, 
can you really get the quality people that can sit in that room and give you the types of uh, uh, contributions that can actually drive the country? And you're going to have majority of these unemployed youths who then will see this as an opportunity you know, to have a bite of the a piece of the national cake. Sorry, um, I, I missed the question. Sorry, the, All right. the network was yeah. very poor. All right, so I was saying I that um, if you look at the fact that youth unemployment is, is, is um, a big uh, issue in Nigeria, uh, if you then say you want to set up a conference, uh, would you get the kinds of productive youth who would rather not be able to abandon what they're doing to go sit with you in a room for 30 days? Uh, would it not be a situation where you don't have majority of these unemployed youths who would then see this as an opportunity to have a piece of the national cake? Yeah, that's what I'm very skeptical about a conference for 30, for 30 days. Uh, for me, it's just a jamboree. Uh, they say action speaks louder than words. The things that the government could do, uh, there, are, there are projects around agriculture that the government could invest in, uh, youth agriculture that could, they could invest in, that they're not doing anything about. You have a country whereby you have uh, bank loans of about interest rate of about 37%. Nobody does business with 37%. It's not possible. Um, so those are the fundamental issues that the government should be dealing with rather than have another jamboree. What are they doing about uh, empowering the youth in terms of agriculture, in terms of industry, uh, how, how about having um, industrial parks, for, for the youth to, to be gainfully employed, for, to gainfully apply their trade, whether the subsidies from the government or support, subsidies loan from the government. That's what you expect to see in terms of dealing with the youth unemployment, not a, a 30 days conference. I'm, I'm, that's why I'm very skeptical about it. What we need are concrete plans. We need a national plan. When America was coming out of the Second World War, and it had a depression. They had a Marshall Plan as to how to get America to where it should be. What the government needs is a Marshall Plan to deal with youth unemployment, not a conference. And the, we don't have to have the conference, the, the youth being there. There are people that they could speak to about having a Marshall Plan. And this will be things like having uh, support for, for, for uh, small scale industries, for, for um, soft loans for businesses, particularly uh, small biz uh, businesses being owned by uh, the youth. Those are the things that we need to be looking at rather than conference. I'm sure if the fund to power a 30 days conference is put into youth empowerment and industrial development, the youth will be much, much better in that, with that, uh, in that regard. So in, in other words, you, you, you are of the opinion that we indeed don't need a conference to know what the youths uh, need or to communicate a uh, government's plan for the youths to the Nigerian youths, not a, a conference for the Nigerian youths. If, if a government is doing what it should be doing, people should know what the government have for the for the youths. You don't need a conference to do that. Um, you have the uh, the the ministry for industry. You have the youth youth and culture ministry. You have ministry for information. By the time you're having a thirty days conference, it shows that you have failed to communicate with your audience. Very well put, um, um, Keshe Clement. Very well put. Uh, let's let's go to Roy and, and get his perspective. If you would want to comment on uh, on the conference, or better still, let's look at concerns around um, uh, terrorism and kidnapping in the south, in the south, in the southeast uh, that seem to be taking an unprecedented uh, uh, dimension at the moment. Roy, if you are still there, David, you are breaking. Oh, well, we can't get what okay. you're saying. Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. What what what, yes, what, can, what what can you say about the what what many would call a resurgence of um, of uh, uh, banditry and kidnapping in the south in the southeast? Where are we getting it wrong? What is government not doing right uh, within the southeast uh, uh, and maybe uh, some part of the the south the southwest as well? What are we not doing right? Okay. Let me take the end of your question what are we not doing right to banditry kidnapping in the southeast 
I think that is um, like the bone of what you want to ask me. Now, if you look at Nigeria and you begin to break it down to north, south, east, and west, you are part of the problem bringing in the disparity in our tribal, political, and our religious differences. I think we have a federal police. You know, we have a federal DSS. We have a federal NDLEA. We have a federal prison service. We have a federal immigration service. You know, we have federal road safety. So most of these federal agencies are the interveners. Those are the meeting points for our insecurity in Nigeria nationwide. So by the time we start talking about what are we supposed to do for insecurity in the East, what are we supposed to do for insecurity in the North, you know, we are basically saying that we have divided Nigeria, you know. But let me go by your question because we are already in that state currently. Now, in those areas where we have kidnapping, before now, we were saying that it was perpetrated by the Fulani headsmen. And I used to ask people, I said, there are people in Edo State, youths in Edo States, that when they fight among themselves, community to community, you will see warring factions with warmongers burning down places, you know? If you look at cultism also in our universities and higher institutions in the states, and most of our universities and higher institutions, they are not urban centers. And most of our universities and higher institutions that do cultism, that go to initiate members, they do this in the bush. So I was asking myself, if we have our control of our non-police areas, where we initiate our court members, where we also fight as youths. Why can't we also, in that might, deter any kind of incursion of any other tribe to come and kill and rape and burn down our cities? You know, so going also to the federal agencies, we must understand that every part of Nigeria is the territorial integrity of Nigeria. So people perpetrating kidnapping, every other vices in the north, in the south, in the east, should face the criminal justice system. And the, the criminal justice system must be swift, must be fair, balanced, and must not be compromised in any way. If we can do that, then we'll be sure that there is nothing like, how do you see banditry in the north? How do you see kidnapping? in the east nigeria is nigeria and i've always not agreed with um i've not agreed with people that postulate that there should be a different system of tackling insecurity in any part of nigeria the law is federal and the federal law must capture every criminal activity in the territorial ter ter territorial integrity of nigeria Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much, Ambassador Roy. As we uh, uh, coast home on this interview, I'd like us to talk a bit about politics, uh, particularly with reference to the performance of those in government uh, today. Uh, just recently, a few days ago, the president hinted on the fact that you he are was... off radar, sir. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. So I'll just go ahead. Can you hear me? All right, it looks like um, there's a challenge uh, with um, the connection there. Can you hear me now, Mr. Ambassador Roy? Yes, you are on now. Oh, you great, great. I was saying that uh, let's talk a bit of politics before we wrap up today. Um, a few days ago, the president hinted of uh, his plans to uh, review his cabinet, uh, and then he talked about um, only those who had performed will remain in, in, in the government. Uh, so let's look at uh, an assessment of how we have done with our political appointments, you know, all through, uh, you know, from independence till date and how the type of culture that we have developed, if indeed it's giving us the type of results that we need. Uh, people begin to ask questions about 
the issue of uh, federal character uh, and um, that's not, that's the, that's the other one about uh, where you have you need to have ministers you know uh, representing the quota system and all of that uh, and, and largely this has influenced our political uh, behavior uh, you know so is it giving us the type of result that we want 60, 64 years after let me let me assure you and um, it's unfortunate that we are having um, um, this kind of uh, break in transmission. Maybe it's from the studio or wherever. Now, let me assure you, sir, that punitive measures for malpractices is a very key deterrent for any minister coming on board. Punitive measures. You remember the Better Edu saga? Till today, as I speak to you, there is no proper closure that we give comfort and happiness to the people that they are serving. The military veterans, as we speak, one of the grievances of the military veteran is because they were not able to assess the palliative that was promised. And that distortion came from the misbehavior of the ministry to address the issue promptly and disburse immediately. Now, if you look at so many other ministers that have compromised, you will see that Nigeria don't have prompt disbursement of justice. If the ministers that have misbehaved are dealt with by the law, then those coming on board, whether by federal quota system even if you are a round peg in the square hole the moment you come in if you cannot square yourself into the hole as a round peg you will resign why because you will be skeptical about the punitive measures that hold against those that would violate government institution instituted rules you know and if you recall there's even a son to one of our government heads that ran away with the father's money in foreign currency. That man has not been called to answer questions till today. Why he has those foreign currencies in his house? You know, using the system of uh, hard currency. So we cannot say that whoever is coming should be a round peg in a round hole. We cannot say if you are going to use quota system because politics in Nigeria now is to favor those that fought for the incoming and the instituted government. So since you want to favor your people, we don't have any problem with that. What I'm asking for is those that committed offenses and those that are coming in, what body language are you showing to them to show that if you misbehave, this is the result that you will get. Oh, all right, <laughs> let's go to Mr. Shea Clement. I would like your reaction to this question as well. Um, in terms of quota system and federal character, it's a recognition of the diversity of the Nigerian state. So it is something we may have to live with for a long time to come. Hopefully we'll get to the stage where it would not matter much where you come from for you to be a minister on or whatever the case may be. Maybe we'll get to a situation whereby when you go to the hospital, you don't ask what religion or what tribe is your doctor. You just want to be to be taken care of. Well, we're not there yet. We're 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 a work in progress. And there is no uh, there is no uh I have no issues with a government selecting those who have been uh, party to his success. It happens everywhere in the world. You choose people that you want to work with. The question we need to ask ourselves is the, what I said earlier. Are we putting our best people forward? That is the question we need to be asking ourselves. Aside from the issue about uh, dealing with transgression, the selection process itself is flawed. We have situations whereby we have ministers who are facing EFCC trials before they become ministers. We have a system whereby EFCC only targets those who are 
perceived to be opposed to the to the party in power or the government in power. So what would you expect from a situation of that nature? You have that those are the issues that we need to ask ourselves. It's first the selection process. Because once you've selected the wrong person, it's difficult politically to get rid of that person. So we need to go back to the drawing board. How do we select our ministers? How do we select our public office holders? What are the deliverables for those officers? What are the KPIs that we employ to to uh, to uh, select those people? Those are the issues that we've not we've not addressed at all. So I would not be surprised where someone is made a minister just because he was friends with someone and someone recommended them because they are power powerhouse in their local community. Is that the best criteria for a minister? Until we address those issues, we will still have this this revolving doors of poor performance being retained or people going there and say, oh, I've spent X amount to get big, bring this government to power. It's my turn now to make my own money back. Those are the issues we'll keep on facing. And we don't, we, we know our, our uh, justice system is not efficient enough and it's not quick enough to address these issues. We have people who have been who are on bail just walking around the place. We have someone who was supposed to be in jail for six six months with telling us recently that they spent the six months uh, at an apartment. So we recognize the fact that our justice system is not working. So we need to look at making sure the right people get into the offices. We still have not addressed those issues. I said, what makes a person a minister? And we've not addressed those. Yeah. So I'm afraid shuffle or no shuffle, we'll still be back here. Yes, after. Well, unfortunately. Well, say, say, say Clement, I, I must say it is a sad place we seem to have found ourselves as, as a nation. Uh, that we have to keep going through this every year, every every administration. It's either it is party decisions or it's party politics or it's uh, loyal lo loyalist to the party and all of that. Someone did say, join our party and your sins are forgiven. You begin to wonder where this will take us, uh, take us to. Shay Clement, it's always a pleasure having you come talk to us on News Up. Always, always a pleasure, Shay. Always. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your time with us on the show. Thank you. And um, Ambassador Roy, it is where we draw the curtain. Thank you so very much for your contributions. Always a pleasure having you. Uh, you know, take out the pain. Uh, wake up in the wee hours of the morning because we know you are not. You are not. You, know, you are offshore at the moment. You are in the U.S. Uh, you took the pain to wake up. This Thank morning. you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you very <laughs> it's much. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Roy. Thank you.